How do we raise emotionally healthy kids in the area of violent media, cyberbullying, and kids spending upwards of seven hours a day on screen time? I'm Carol Lloyd, executive editor at Great Schools, and this is Emotional Smarts Conversations on Parenting. Today we're exploring the connection between video games and emotional intelligence, and with two experts with unique perspectives that shed fresh light on how these two things can come together and not be at odds with one another. Dr. Jeremy Richmond is a research neuroscientist and founder of the Aviel Foundation, an organization that seeks to prevent violence and build compassion through brain health research, community education and engagement. Jessica Berlinski is Chief Impact Officer of Personalized Learning Games, which produces evidence-based video games that cultivate social-emotional learning. Welcome. Thanks, Carol. It's good to be here. Uh, Jessica, I'd like to start with you. Uh, there's a lot of information and research that shows that screens are hindering social-emotional learning, whether because it's isolating kids or teaching them how to shoot to kill. But there's also some things that are unique about gaming that can actually support learning or specifically social emotional learning. Could you just talk about these things just to start us off? Sure. Uh, I think there are three. Uh, there are three that I like to identify, and one is for all learning. Um, when we think about games building any skill, um, whether it's social emotional or otherwise, and that is their unique ability to personalize learning. And what I mean by this is, you know, kids are, we know that kids are incredibly engaged in video games. And the reason for this is that games have the ability to challenge kids, or adults for that matter, just one notch higher than their own difficulty level. So games find that level, they adapt to that level, and then they challenge just one notch higher. And so in this way, they're actually finding kind of the sweet spot of engagement for a child. And when we think about a learning game doing this, it's, it's exactly what we, what we strive for in learning. We strive to meet a child exactly where they're at, and support them where needed, and then challenge them one, one notch higher. So we're not losing the child by challenging them you know, at a level they can't possibly meet. What about social-emotional learning specifically? Yeah, sure. So two things in that, in that regard. I think games have a unique ability to um, support perseverance. And here's how. When, if we want our ch children, which we do, to persevere through failure, and, and as educators and parents we want that, there are very few environments that nurture the belief that it's okay to fail, that you can fail and you should just pick up and, and you're, you're able to move forward. And games, within a game, 80% of time a player is failing. Yet they're totally motivated to keep moving forward. And Jane McGonigal talks about this in, in her book, Reality is Broken. But it's this ability of a game to give positive failure feedback and motivate a child or a player to keep going. And we want that's, kids That's to great. Have, that's great. Sorry to interrupt you. No, um, no, no. no I, I can keep going to, here. I can keep going. <laughs> I just want to get um, a little bit of housekeeping out of the way that I forgot, which is, um, join us, put your, put your questions on the um, Google Hangout page and tweet the, with the um, hashtag emotional smarts. And Annie Fox, the parenting expert, is also live tweeting this, so uh, join her as well. Um, Jeremy, uh, Richmond, you have such a unique um, experience coming at this, both from uh, uh, your life experience and from your, your career. So. What led you to create the Aviel Foundation? Well, you know, we all get involved in things that touch us personally. And uh, when I was young, I had a grandfather that had Alzheimer's disease. And um, while it was a very tragic disease, it fascinated me how dramatically our personalities can change with the disease of the, of the brain. And so I became a neuroscientist. Unfortunately, um, uh, I always have to introduce myself in two ways, not only as a scientist, but as a parent, as you said, that lost my daughter to murder in the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings on December 14th of 2012. 
And uh, at that time, as you can imagine, we were, my wife Jennifer and I were quite distraught and, um, and, and heartbroken and needed to do something to change the world to prevent somebody else from suffering in such a horrific way. And we're both scientists, and so, again, being touched personally by, by violence in this case, we wanted to play to our strengths, and so we started the Aviel Foundation, which is uh, an organization with a mission to understanding what goes wrong in the brain that leads to violent behaviors and how we can foster compassion through that understanding and, um, and educate communities in those, uh, what we understand now and what we learn tomorrow. Well, Jeremy, um, I, I just want to acknowledge your loss and 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 this the amazing work that you're trying to do. And but I think it's really interesting. Like I I could imagine someone like you would say, okay, I'm going to foster brain health, and one of the first things I want to do is say, let's get these kids off video games or something like that. You know, something that's an isolating factor. So. So how is it that you're someone here that could speak to like the, the potential for for gaming to actually help kids social emotional learning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I go around the country giving giving talks on the the science of violence and compassion, I talk about on one side risk factors that lead somebody to engage in a violent or aggressive act and protective factors that prevent somebody from doing so. And I go down the list and I talk about you know, child abuse or substance abuse. I talk about traumatic brain injury. I talk about nutrition. All things that could be risk factors that lead somebody to engaging in violence. And one of those risk factors is violent media. And when I get to that part and I and I pull the audience, when I say that violent media leads to a risk, increased risk of engaging in violence, and I ask them what media I'm talking about, 100% of the time they say video games. But the truth of the matter is that there's as, as it stands yet, there's very little evidence to support the harming effects of video games. But that's yet. What does exist is an unbelievable large amount of data to support the fact that everywhere else, aggression in our television, in our media news outlets, and in our advertisements lead to an increased uh, risk of engaging in violence and aggressive acts. This is so much, so profound, such a strong supporting science that two Surgeon Generals have issued Surgeon General warnings about violent media. Now, if we think about that, uh, the television is a passive entertainment. We're just watchers. And we think that video games oftentimes, for the most part nowadays, are fully immersive, first-person, real-time, and fully engaging. Of course, they're going to have a profound effect on our behaviors. But the fact is, um, as Jessica was alluding to earlier, there, video games aren't going to go away. 95% uh, of our children play video games. Uh, the, they're, they're not going to go away. And what an opportunity we would be giving up if we didn't use them, since they're such incredible tools, for, for educational purposes, to build social-emotional learning skills and education in general, because they are primed to do that. What, what, what we have to do as parents and concerned citizens is demand that video game manufacturers make games that, uh, that engender these, these skills instead of ones that are, uh, that are harmful and, uh, and, and damaging. So, so that, that's a great segue into, uh, uh, we've gotten so many responses, there's so many amazing questions from parents, but uh, I wanted to start with one um, from uh, Three Sun and On, what, what research has been done to back up the claim that games boost brain health and emotional well-being? I understand that researchers have been unable to duplicate some claims of um, like brain health companies about their claims ability to enhance brain performance. So what's the what's the basis? We know that negative media can have negative effects. Are there is there good research right now showing that positive media, or positive uh, video games, are 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 can change kids' um, internal behavior? Or yeah. Okay. That this is this is a, a oh, Jessica. You want to you want to take that? I'm happy to 
share some uh, some of the latest research on that. Um, Go for it. Okay. Uh, the, the, there's a group of researchers with whom I'm working now that actually are all funded by the Department of Education. And um, what they have found is that social and emotional learning skill building games, in this case a game by the name of Zoo You, uh, actually builds six core social and emotional skills in real life, which is counterintuitive because we don't think of a device as having the capacity to actually build a, a real world social skill. We think that's just between, that can only be built between people. Um, but what they found, and they found this through validated testing with parent observations, with actually a, um, a valid measure called the Basque test, is that in real life the skills of emotion regulation, impulse control, empathy, and then the social skills, cooperation, uh, communication, and social initiation could actually be fostered, built, and improved in real life through a device. Um, and, the, and there's a key additional piece of data on this that, that I think is the special sauce to this, which is that they also found that self-efficacy could improve in kids. And, and that idea, it's a very kind of academic term, what does self-efficacy mean? But kind of the, a lay way of thinking about it is confidence. Do kids have the confidence not only to have this skill set, but to employ it where they need to in real life social situations? And so they also found evidence that, that games or this game in particular, built that in kids. And now this isn't all games, this is new data, this is new research, um, but it does exist and it's really important that we start to, as Jeremy said, get it out there so that parents know about it and then, and then very importantly, the industry at large knows about so, it. So that's also something that's a, come in through all these questions. People think of video games as sort of one thing, one type of thing. And so many of the questions are like, what? You know, video games, you mean the, you know, what is it, uh, Call of Duty is helping my child learn social-emotional skills? And I don't, my guess is that's not exactly what you're saying. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, and I, and I thank you, Carol, for bringing that up, because I think that's a really key point. I mean, there, there, and this is really the, um, the, the interesting part of this whole discussion is that devices and technology are indeed stripping children of social and emotional skills. Um, and that's been proven. Like when we're trying to, you know, now cram emotional matters into tweets, right, and Facebook posts, <laughs> we're losing, um, you know, complex emotional nuance. And what's happening, and, and there is research that supports that kids are becoming less compassionate and less attentive. So I think our um, our kind of argument here, or, or and I don't like to use the word argument, but but are there ways, and there are, which we can actually leverage technology, and in this case games, to actually build the skills that some technologies are stripping away in our culture yeah. right now. So it's a really valid question that a lot of these parents are kind of identifying. So so. Jeremy, you're a, a new dad, and you are um, going to have technology in your home, I presume, and how are you going to make decisions about what your child does, so what kind of, what kind of uh, video, video game experience you're gonna, your, your child's going to have? Yeah, hashtag unplug. Um, <laughs> the, here is, the, the key here is that, that uh, like Jessica was saying, there's, there's nothing that can compensate for 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 FaceTime, for an exchange, for, for communication, cooperation in the real world. That it, it, you, you just can't. Um, me, personally, I'm going to try to do my best to, um, to keep our, our young daughter off of you know, screen time uh, for at least two years and uh, as, as much as possible and, um, and develop you know, t reading, to, reading to her uh, with my own voice and looking at her in the face and playing with her one-on-one, -on -one, trying to do my best uh, not to look at the phone messages and, and to draw attention to it. Um, after that, there are um, good and, and bad um, 
you know, media sources uh, that, you know, games being can be good or bad, um, you know, television can be good or bad, uh, and, and limiting it. The key, though, is to interact with the child the whole time that they're engaged. So it's ah, not, a, so it's not, not as a babysitter. The kind of video game or the kind of media, but your interaction with the person before, during, after, that, 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 that that's, that's part of the process. I, I have a question. Um, Isolis asked, how much time should I allow my children, who are one and a half and three years old, to play electronic games? I think that's Zero. a great question. Because a lot of parents, they really are, they're, they're trying to navigate this. They don't know how much time is okay. So for kids one and a half to three years old, what do the experts say? Well, Less I, than two years old, none. <laughs> none. Under two years old, none. So four so years above, old, six years above old. Above that, that, this is this is the kind of going recommendation, which is, um, and this is from the American Pediatric Association. That somewhere above that, um, one to two hours. But one of the um, uh, that's the screen time, right? And that's all screen time, exactly. But one of the things that, that I really like is the recommendation, and, and, and this from a number of different researchers, to if, if you're worried about the amount of screen time your child is um, either engaged with the game or you know, screen time in general, make a plan and make the plan with your child. Integrate your child into, okay, well, we're going to make a plan together for screen time. And, and let's not make this a... Uh, a punishment. Let's do this together to figure out what feels right, um, and and that's something that uh, you know I, I think is a powerful way to look at um, kind of collaborating around this this idea of limited screen time. Yeah. And Good. so now that there's a little bit of a industry building around more intelligent gaming, more enlightened gaming, um, I. I know from the research, even some of the their, their brain enhancement from for whatever this is what I've read. Whatever the game practices, that is what it strengthens. So if it's practicing something that's uh, violent but also involves hand-eye coordination, it may help your kids hand-eye coordination. It also may help reduce their empathy. On the other hand, if it's practicing empathy and it's practicing something else, that is what's going to influence their brain. So where do parents find the smart, well-made games that their kids will actually play? Because I think that's also a tough thing. Like some educational products, the children will be like, yes, no, I've, 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 seen, the, I've seen the big guns, and I want something fun to do. So where, how, how do you recommend parents find these? Well, there's a couple resources out there that are exceptional. Um, one of them is Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media actually has two different rating scales. It has a rating scale specifically for parents and then one for educators around games. And they look at the age appropriateness, they look at the learning value, and then they even dive deeper into that to look at, okay, are there positive role models in this game? Um, what are privacy and safety concerns in this game that you might want to be aware of, etc.? Um, so a brilliant resource to uh, go to as kind of a first stop. Um, also, if your child has learning or attention issues, there is a new site out there that is extraordinary called understood.org. Um, and it was built as a resource for parents with children who struggle in these ways um, and has information on games and everything beyond. Um, so, so those are two places where I would start. But one, you know, one nice recommendation that, that I've heard again and again is play the game, is use your parental intuition and spend a little time on that game. Um, and and you know, you you as a parent have That's quite a, a bit of natural intuition. Right. A lot of parents might not even consider that. That's a great idea. Um, you know, and an, and another point to to follow up on that, Carol, real yeah. quick is you know um, I I, don't, I I think that there's a huge absence of ga games that you can substitute for 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 the violent games. There's there's an absence. The violent video games that are that are incredibly graphic and violent that we know are, are, are likely harming 
uh, to our behaviors and our brains. Uh, they represent 20%, what, $1.2 billion of, of industry. And I think that parents have to recognize that that's our buying power. That's, that's our voice, that we represent a huge value to the gaming industry. And if we say we would rather this than that, they'll make it. They'll make it for us, and they'll make it fun, and they'll make it entertaining, and it'll make it something that your kids will want to play. So one of the things that uh, is is been coming up a lot is the concept of using games to shore up a weakness. So Becky Robinson asked, how would you spark an interest of a child who's already hooked on gaming and uses his gaming to as his feel-good fix for his ADHD? I think ADHD is real... Uh, Gaming is very popular with kids who have ADHD. It's like oftentimes a great they're 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 intensely focused. And so, what's your recommendation for parents who are kind of grappling? Like, should I focus on limiting screen time, or should I try to find really focus on trying to find the right games to help them? Well, there are a number so, of games. Oh, you you take this, Jeremy, and then I'll jump in. Well, yeah, ju jump in. No, I, I'll just uh, real briefly. You know, uh, clearly there's two things at, at play here. The parents need to definitely balance the amount of screen time that their um, their attention deficit child uh, is is allowed um, with you know what they think is actually getting them to focus, which they think is a good thing, and that's that's very good. But again, um, the theme that we keep coming to is is what games they're playing really matter. So if you're if 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 uh, they're able to focus in a gaming environment, great, let's give them some games that are appropriate and, and building skills that that develop um, self mastery, emotional control, impulse control, and social emotional skills. So, Jessica? Jessica? Yeah, and I mean just to kind of piggyback a little bit there. You know, there are games that are specifically developed for children struggling with learning and attention issues. Um, there, is a, there is a game that, that the group of researchers with whom I work are coming out with soon, soon called Stories in Motion, and it actually allows a child um, struggling with, with ADHD to an autism to move through a, a series of, to actually create create their own story around different different social challenges and then the game allows them to take that story and create a comic book so to have their own kind of real life comic book to you know then walk into the world with and and that there there's rich evidence that this is a really powerful tool that actually supports um, kids with these issues uh, to again attack real-world challenges in, in real life. However, my, I think yes. an important piece here is the evidence base. Look into, if your child is, you know, knee-deep in a game, investigate that game. Like, are there, is it proven to actually teach what it's claiming to teach, or what you as a parent want it to teach your child? So, uh, that, your, the game that you just described to me sounds really different than I think what a lot of people think of as um, as video games where you're sort of following, you're moving through a path and, and things are very uh, framed for you and it's not necessarily very creative, but uh, Jackie Huggins-Hill asks, does gaming contribute to creativity? Well, I think that depends on the game. I mean, I, we, we, if we're parents and we have kids with Minecraft, there is an extraordinary amount. It's a sandbox game, so we're able to uh, create and uh, interact and and really explore uh, a world of imagination in that particular game. So you know, I think it's certainly possible, but again, it really depends on which game are you playing. So, how long or what's a good measure of time to allow children to play games without it being too extreme? For older kids, say 10-year-olds, what's the right amount? I, Jeremy, you want to take this? Because I, I would stick to my previous comment, which is that no one has come across 
uh, yet, as far as I know, um, from a research perspective, and really given a, a strict number to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a process of, again, you know, looking at, okay, so how is my child behaving after his gameplay or her gameplay? You know, am I seeing, uh, you know, behavior that, that, that doesn't engender empathy and that I'm worried right. about? Tailor it to your child and their behavior. Yeah, you know, again, use your intuition there. I mean, I think there's this broad recommendation of one to two hours for, um, you know, both children and preteens. But within that range, I think it's a matter of, of kind of looking at, okay, is this something that I see my child is really engaged in and is fostering some behaviors that are very pro-social or not? And then, and then, again, you know, working with your child to make a plan. Right. Yeah. I think that there's there's a number of themes that are already surfacing. One is, you know, uh, it's not it's not a one one size fits all. You know, you have to be engaged in your child's uh, growth and environment. So check the game out and engage in it with them, so that it's not just a, a babysitter. Um, watch monitor their moods and changes and recognize that it, it could be better or worse and um, be open to both and then um, you know remember that there's no there's no uh, it, there's no um, replacement for one-on-one -on -one time so mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not going to engender better social skills than being social with them so What about, what I think is one of the interesting things, uh, I've sort of been an anti-gaming mom. I have an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old, and we know less about gaming than almost any family. But game, a game got into our house, and it spread like a, like a, like a disease. <laughs> and it was, people became obsessed with it. They couldn't get off it. I feel like there's something about the obsessive nature of gaming, which is potential to be incredibly um, powerful, destructive, or 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 beneficial. And I wonder. I I think that 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 issue, like, is there research on um, the kind of addictive quality of gaming and how that influences your children's brains? Out there, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there is, um, and you have to. Some of it's blatantly obvious, looking just at that, and some others uh, are looking at different qualities. Um, one, one of the one of the things that that Jessica and I write about in an article we published last December is is the the uh, the, the nature of it. picture this picture going into a, a classroom and taking a math test and and failing, you know, ten times and passing on the 11th time. And then they say, okay, get ready next week, we're going to do this again. That just seems ludicrous. But in a gaming environment, that's what we do. You fail over and over and over again, and when you succeed, it feels so good that it sucks you into going to that next level. Um, there are so many qualities that, that, that like uh, the, in the introduction today that Jessica pointed out, it's so personalized just to you, just to the gamer, that it, it gets to the limits of where you you have to succeed, and then when you do that, release in the brain of success is so good that you you want more, and it taps into that pleasure center the same as as a uh, food shopping, you know, uh, you know, uh, other things in life that that give you the, the pleasures and and reinforce and reinforce the behavior. Games tap into that. Right. So again, uh, just like food and nutrition for health, uh, games could be healthy and they could be unhealthy. Uh, you right. know, uh, addictions to exercise can be unhealthy or healthy. Right, they're habit forming. You know, and yeah. one, you know, one a key point, another point here, because you talked a little bit about compassion. Uh, you know, Jeremy's mission is around compassion, and one of the core social emotional learning skills is empathy. And and one of the affordances of games to build empathy in children is this rich environment that they. Um, allow for, for role-playing, for taking on another's perspective, for walking in another's shoes and making decisions as that person, and, and, all, and doing all of that in an environment that is safe, 
because they're not going to have real world consequences of their decisions. So this is another uh, kind of affordance or benefit of, of role play games and obviously specific role play games, not shooter role play games, but of games in general to actually build this capacity, this, this core 21st century skill in children of, of building empathy. So I, I'd be remiss if I didn't throw that into this hangout at some point because it's a uh, it's a rich facet of, of video games for building social and emotional and, skills. And absolutely, and again, a really a critical thing uh, aspect just to, to dovetail onto that, Jessica, and we've talked about this in, in a, a large degree, is that um, even in games where you are going to role play, say, the bad guy, this gives somebody an opportunity, a child, an opportunity to experience an alternate version see what the consequences are of doing, say, bad things. And this also highlights how important it is to engage and interact with your kids so you can say, wow, look at the consequences of that. What do you think that would be like in the real world? And, and bridge that so that um, you can really reinforce that. It's, a, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be able to try in a completely uh, safe environment, try the bad thing and see what the consequences are. You right. can't and do that in the real world. Right, and, and I think what you're drawing, uh, uh, sort of an a, a in, implicit analogy to like great literature, we don't expect kids to grow up reading books their entire life through K through 12 and never see a negative character, right? right. We, we want kids to see negative actions, explore negative characters, write about it, think about it, in, sort of empathize with the person and then realize that you don't really want to be them in real life. And and so I think if, if games rise to the level of what they could be, you could have that same experience where people are really grappling with more complex things rather than should I go left or should I go right. I th that's yeah. a good point. That's a really good point, Carol. There's, you know, there's a wonderful. I'll give a plug to this. There's a wonderful ebook that is called Family Time with Apps, which actually walks through a whole host of different ways to use games and apps as bridges between the in-game world and then real-life activity and interaction and and you know family nurturing. And it's it's a wonderful tool that I think. Um, is a support to a lot of what we've said here today. So I bet you both have lots of great resources, and we're going to put post more on the Google Hangout page. And I appreciate your time so much. We that sped by. And um, if you all want to get on the Google Hangout page and respond, there's so many questions, so much commentary. I would love to have everybody continue the conversation. Um, thanks. Both, to both of you, Jeremy and Jessica, this was an awesome conversation. Well, thank you so much for having us, Carol. And uh, I think Jeremy and I feel passionate about this topic. So yes, ask away, and we will we will absolutely do our best to get back with uh, with answers. Yep. And thank you, Jeremy. And I look forward to seeing more of what your foundation, your new foundation, is going to do. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you and goodbye.